Welcome to One Million Cups. How many of you are new for the first time? Well, welcome. Um, how many of you brought somebody today? Come on, guys. All right, good for you. Um, goal for next week, let's all bring somebody new. All right, okay. Um, so a couple of, of announcements. Um, we are launching four cities next week. Um, Prince William County, Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Springfield, Missouri. Um, so speaking of cities, um, we actually have one of our presenters today that came all the way from St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, his name is Fran Snyder, and he is with Office Concerts. So let's welcome him to the stage. Oh, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I am actually really thrilled to be here at the Mothership. I, uh, I presented in St. Petersburg, uh, I guess in December, and I think it was maybe their third or fourth week there. And uh, it's, it's, this is just a wonderful thing that you guys are part of, and I'm, I'm glad to see you here. Uh, I'm going to tell you briefly uh, just a little bit of history. Um, I'm going to present a brand new concept to you and then talk briefly about how you and potentially your business could get involved in being part of this pretty remarkable story. So I'm a singer-songwriter, and uh, for the past six or seven years, I have devoted almost every waking hour to creating events like this. You have a prof professional touring singer-songwriter playing in front of a listening, adoring crowd. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, what you're seeing here is basically what we, call, what we call a house concert, and it's a tradition that goes back hundreds of years. Um, <clears throat> back then they used to call it chamber music, um, but we call them house concerts now. And what's happened in the past 10 years is these house concerts have become the most vital part of the touring industry for small independent acts. Let me say that again. It is the most vital part of the touring industry for small in independent acts. What does that mean? That means if you're a singer-songwriter, you probably don't tour without doing some house concerts. So essentially, I created, uh, back in 2000, 2006, actually I, I had just moved to, to Lawrence, Kansas. I lived there for six years. And I created a website called Concerts in Your Home and uh, to basically inspire and train and, and help connect the people that were interested in this. And essentially, these are, these are super fans. They invite an artist to come into their house. They set up 20, 30 chairs. Everybody chips in money for the musician. And the artist is typically a guest overnight in the home, so they really get to bond, become friends, and uh, you know, send them off with breakfast the, ne the next morning. So we've grown and grown, and uh, now do about 2,000 events per year worldwide. Uh, the mo majority of the activity is in the United States, but we're, uh, we, we've got some action in, in Western Europe. Uh, you can't see Alaska and Hawaii, but they are on the map. Uh, we have some house concerts in New Zealand and Australia as well. So if you find that interesting or remarkable, you're not alone. We've been covered in Mil Billboard, New York Times, CD Baby. That's me on the cover of American Way magazine there. So, but that's not why I'm here. This, this is sort of the success I've had so far in, in trying to change the culture of, of how we experience music because so oftentimes music is one of many distractions and we're expected to listen to a musician while there's a TV over their head or the game's on or there's all kinds of distractions. And we know that there are super fans out there that just love this experience. And, um, and so we've built this network. We've got all these wonderful artists, hundreds of artists, hundreds of house concert hosts around the world. And uh, we thought we'd find something new for them. And uh, we came up with the idea of office concerts. And uh, why, would, why, would, why would you want to have live music in the workplace? Well, uh, not only is it a bunch of fun, but we're actually finding out that live music in the workplace can actually be a fantastic wellness program. Um, and you can have wellness programs for the low, low price of $6 billion. That's how much uh, US corporations spend every year on wellness programs, and we'd like to have a little bit of that. Uh, research is showing us that uh, two things, basically taking a real break where you're disengaged from work in the middle of the day is, is wonderful for your concentration and energy, and music, as you can all pretty much 
gas. It's proven to be therapeutic, energizing, even inspirational. They take musicians into hospitals now, and, and there's just wonderful music therapy program. So what we're offering is the best of both worlds, a real break at work with music. So we've already got some testimonials. Um, we, did, uh, we did this at, in uh, St. Petersburg. So let's have an office concert. What is that like? It's basically easy to set up. Everybody drags in, the chair, drags in their office chair into a common area. 35-minute um, concert with a two-song encore. If you guys need to get back to work, that's cool. But if, uh, if you've got the slack time and everybody's into it, you can get two more songs. Uh, we have, again, we already have a network of professional independent touring artists uh, who do you know, fun, moving performances. And, and who would do this? What kind of artists would actually play in your office? Well, we have Rebecca Lobey from season one of The Voice. We have Mika Polly, Starbucks Emerging Artist of the Year. Uh, these wonderful twins from Victoria, British Columbia. Kira Small just got off tour with Martina McBride and Sean Hopper, just to name a few. Um, Sean is one of the best guitarists in the Southeast. Um, so, so that's the central idea, is the office concerts. That's what I wanted to share with you today. But uh, to launch office concerts, we thought we'd, we'd, we'd try to make a big splash. And what we're going to do is, uh, is put together basically the most unique music festival on the planet. We have artists coming from all over the world that are coming to, uh, to Florida to play office concerts during the day, and living, living room concerts at night. And we also take them into schools, hospitals, and, uh, and really just have a, a wonderful impact on the community. So each, each of these office concerts actually helps us pay uh, the artists to go in the schools. Um, and some of the sponsorship programs actually uh, fund performances at the school in the name of the, com in the, name of the company that's, that's uh, doing it. So the companies that are getting involved with this can enrich their brand as well as their community. And uh, we're offering a discount. Um, and sponsors who get involved also get to be on the, on the uh, festival commemorative CD. So I know I threw a lot at you. The central idea, again, is office concerts. And the reason I brought up the festival, even though the festival's in Florida, we had anticipated that we were just gonna, we were gonna have 50 office concerts and 50 house concerts in one week in Florida. But right away, we were, gonna, we were gonna take it nationally after the festival, but we've already gotten interest around the country um, before we even had the website up. Uh, uh, we had a, a partner in St. Petersburg that had, office, had offices in Detroit and Phoenix, and they're having their first office concert today in Phoenix. So it's, it's kind of amazing. We're trying to keep up. And, uh, and the reason I wanted to pre pre present this to you, um, how many people, uh, in here, uh, listen to music while they work. Yeah. And, and, and if you feel that that helps your productivity, let me, let me hear you. Yes. yes. So if, you have, if you'd like to see this idea su succeed, if you'd like uh, to help us grow, we just kind of have this really wonderful opportunity right now to connect these networks that we're building. Um, we have a small, tiny staff that gets really a, a, a lot done. And uh, we need to staff up. So uh, my, my goal this year is, uh, is to raise some capital so that we can staff up and really take advantage of, uh, of, of what's happening. We, we, kind of, we already have proof of concept. We're, um, uh, we're really having a lot of fun with this. So I will take some questions. And then if there's a little time, I'll play a song for you as I close out my presentation. Thank you. Was that under six minutes? Was that yeah. Good? Sweet. Good job. Questions? Thank you. So do you plan to use any local artists for this program here? So for the, uh, for the Listening Room Festival in Florida, we have these six featured acts that I showed you, uh, but six acts cannot possibly do 50 office concerts. So we are filling in with some of the best local talent uh, that, we, that we can get. But we already have sort of a network of vetted performers. Keep in mind, into, in, in the office space, we're gonna have to be very careful. Um, there's some artists that just, you just not, are not gonna be a good fit. You know? uh, so we have, you know, same with, with homes. You know, people who don't bathe might be terrific artists, but they're not good house guests. So, um, not that musicians don't bathe, but there's a couple. Um, 
So, but, so we have kind of, uh, through concerts in your home, we, we already have sort of this vetting screening process that, that uh, is pretty involved. So we're, we're certainly gonna be building our network of artists and expanding it um, as it already is, but uh, um, it's, there's a process. Got a question for you in the back here. Okay, so are you streaming this live from your website so we can watch it from here and can't make it to Florida? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. There's a lot of startups in, uh, in Florida, and, uh, and there's one that's talking about um, helping us sort of crowdsource our festival online. Uh, they're supposed to go live in March. We'll see if they do. If they do, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be up. Yes, sir. So who's, who's, who's choosing the questions? <clears throat> Back to your right. Um, how much does this cost for the company, and uh, what portion or what percentage does the artist get from the proceeds? Okay, so we, we set up the pricing for the festival, and, and, and those packages are being tweaked now for cities outside of Florida because we already have partnerships with nonprofits in. Um, in, in Florida that won't make sense here. You won't care if you're funding the arts in Florida, you'd rather fund the arts here. So it's gonna take us a while to get those kinds of partnerships happening around the country. So we're actually gonna reduce the price of the packages um, for cities outside of Florida. But right now the packages start at 450 and it's roughly in thirds. We get a third, the artist gets a third, and the Arts, uh, arts Alliance gets a third. So, um, but, Companies have been buying these in threes. Um, it's just been really wonderful. So we have a $1,500 package where they get three shows. Um, and, and some of them are buying in twos. Because things we just never anticipated. They're buying one for the, buying three. They're, they're using one for themselves. They want to gift the other two to companies that they work with. And so we had no idea that would happen. We got a question here in the front. Good morning. Good morning. Do I understand they're all 35 minutes? And if so, what's the science of 35 minutes? Well, 30 minutes just seemed too short. And 45 minutes feels like a stretch when you're talking about the workplace. It was just, we, we sort of kicked it around a good bit. And we thought, you know, let's call it 35 minutes. And you get the option for a two-song encore if, 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 the, if the company's into it. Got another question for you in the back here. Yeah. So I think this is a great concept and congratulations for taking it this far. Thanks. Um, have you looked into, since you're targeting wellness as a outcome of this, uh, looking at comedy or stand-up comics kind of coming to the office in the same vein? Because, you know, laughter is supposedly the best medicine. Yeah, well, we've even with house concerts, we you know we've had some comedians that you know juggle and stuff like that. We're we're really a music company at heart, um, and the thing about comedy, there's there's something about there's something very volatile about comedy that I think might make it a tougher fit for the office because um, safe comedy tends to not be that great, and. <laughs> Corporations are going to want safe comedy, I think. So, that's that's my take on it. I I'd love to be proven wrong, and I may be in 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 due course. That's just over here, right here. Yeah, uh, I'm president of a charter school here in Kansas City in the urban core, and one of the things that we do every day is burn off as much energy as we can on kids. Yeah. Do you have any programs for K through eight that would come in, you, you know, whether they're dance programs or sing along or something like that? I think there's a real need for that. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, there, there is a ton of children's entertainment around the country. Um, and so we're, we're sort of learning, we're, we're trying to be focused right now in terms of the community that, we, that we've already built we have, you know, almost a thousand house concerts hosts around the world, and you know, half of them work at an office. So we already have sort of these great ways to plant seeds. Um, so my my quick answer is yes, we'd love to do that. Um, 
is it going to be a, a priority? I'm not sure. Until we can staff up, I have to say that, that it's, it's not something we're going, to, we're going to be able to pursue. But if, if the requests come, we can probably accommodate them. We got a question here in the center. Marketing as a wellness program is great. What about um, office lunches when somebody has a birthday party? And another suggestion is uh, when there's meetings in hotel rooms, have you ever thought about um, after working for four hours doing a little concert for everyone that gets together from around the country? Well, let me tell you a little challenge about what I do, but presenting concerts in the home. Um, we are about creating this intimate connection between the audience and the artist. And what happens is, is four out of five people that I explain this to go, oh yeah, I've been to a house party before. There was a band playing and we were in the kitchen talking. And it's like they, there's a total disconnect with, with the idea that we're trying to get across. And that is everybody paying attention. And so when we talk about having house concerts as, a, as somebody's 50th birthday, well, people are kind of there for the 50th birthday guy not the musician. And so we have this challenge of how do we stay true to this idea of, of promoting independent touring artists who don't want to play Jimmy Buffett at a party because they've released seven CDs, they, they tour the world, and it, they don't want to go play at a winery or at a party and, and take requests all night long. They want to put on their concert because that's what they do. So, but to your point is, we're going to get that request all day long. Can, can we have this in our cafeteria? Can we do that? And what we're going to build is basically a sister, a sister site to accommodate that. Because we have a brand that we really want to protect. This idea of, of the intimate listening experience, promoting artists um, more so than entertainers. So yeah, if you want an Elvis entertainer or Elvis impersonator, that's awesome. But there's plenty of people out there that can do that for you. You don't need us to do that. You know, so, um, but, but it's, it's, it's a legit question because we're, we get it every day. Can we, can, can we do this as a party? You know. Another question in the middle. Yes, I'm wondering if you're interested in working with older artists who used to tour, who got off the road, who would like to travel again. <laughs> if you're amazing, yes. If I'm you, a, yes. If you have videos that show there you. Are, <laughs> there are several of us in this audience. Yeah, if you have videos <laughs> that show you at your best doing what you would be doing, because uh -huh. that's basically part of the audition process that we have a concert in your home, okay. we need to see you do what you do. Okay. And, uh, and we can't go around the country like American Idol auditioning people. Oh, I understand. So, um, but we do cater to the touring singer songwriter that's got the professional website up, they've got their calendar, they've got, you know, they're playing the, uh, you know, they're out there working it. It's not, um, it, the, the artists that we work with, it's not something they do on the side. Generally. Okay. So well, I'll, I'll get you a CD before you leave. All right, all right, fair enough. <laughs> all right, we got a question right here. Have you, you, I know you talked a little bit about pricing and packages. Have you thought about like a subscription model? Because wellness strikes me as something that's continual and not yeah. a one-time thing. Yeah, ideally, we'd love to, to have the, them get on a monthly or quarterly program with these. Um, and that's, again, we're, we just wanted to do Florida for a week and then go national. And so now we're having to scramble to handle sort of the, the out-of-state requests. And here I am just adding fuel to the fire. So, uh, but yeah, absolutely. The, we, you know, we, we don't know what kind of traction we're going to get in terms of a monthly or quarterly, but that's, you know, that's, that would be a terrific business model to have if we can pull that off. Got a question here on your left. Hi. As you are focusing on gearing up and staffing up, are you also considering um, the franchise model to get more local, regional uh, people involved? We've not considered a franchise model, um, but we would <laughs> consider it. That's, that's just the honest truth. We've not considered it. Good morning, Shelley Christensen, IT manager and nurse, yeah. as a wellness program, what percentage of your musicians are formally trained in music therapy, or have you considered that? 
Uh, it's cer certainly something that we've considered, but it's not, um, again, this is brand new. We have sort of a core uh, three to 400 artists that are professionals that can adapt to the situation, but we're not doing it as music therapy as like, we, we get, like what you get at a hospital. But we're, we're taking the research that we see in terms of just music by itself. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, a 12-step program of, of how to get uh, you know, particular points of wellness through music. It's, it's, uh, it's, we're, we're, we're approaching it from a, from a more general standpoint. But we do have um, several dozen artists that are qualified to do music therapy as well. Question to the back left. So interaction with local music's been thrown out a couple of times. Um, I wanted to know if you'd reached out to the Midwest Music Foundation, uh, since you are presenting here in KC. And if not, I encourage you to. All right, thank you. If you have a card or anything, because I probably won't remember that in three minutes. And another question over here. Is there a particular genre of music that's more effective in the wellness program? And also, how do you measure uh, success? Well, we're going to measure success in terms of the offices loving it and wanting to do it again. That's really the bottom line for us. And again, we're not, we're not, going to, we're not looking to, to cure the, world, the workplace of a particular ill other than boredom and, um, or just exhaustion or what tunnel vision or whatever it is. So we don't have specific metrics in, 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 that, in that. Again, we're, we're approaching this as a wellness program, mostly because we know that that's where the money's gonna come from. You know, it's, it, it's gonna be, uh, if they have to justify it in the bottom line, they gotta put it somewhere. And uh, you know, is it, as, is it as, as much a wellness program as bringing a masseuse in once a month? You decide. Got a question back left. Thank you for sharing your idea. It's very Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Um, I'm very impressed by the demand. You're getting interest even though you haven't launched yet. Um, you also are managing a lot of audiences. There's the home, there's the artists, now you're adding the offices, and you also seem pretty deliberate about who you are and who you're not. So I guess I have two questions if, if you're up for it. One is, how are you kind of creating your image with these different communities and kind of keeping your company top of mind? And the second is how much you're looking to raise. Okay, so the first question was, how are we maintaining or, or, or promoting our image? Yeah. Well, we have a web, the, the first website I showed was concertsinyourhome.com. So if you, if house concerts is the thing, if you Google house concerts, you see us right there at the top. And we get 11,000 visitors a month. We, we book 2,000 shows. So anybody who's doing house concerts on a regular basis kind of knows about us if they're not already part of our community. Um, but I, I will tell you that we probably represent less than a percent of house concerts worldwide because Artists are just doing these with their fans, and, and they're emailing their, their fans saying, I'm going on tour, I'm coming through Lexington, Kentucky, you know, I need a place to stay and play, and, and fans are responding. It's, just, it's a, just a wonderful movement. We just happen to be the leader of it, but we don't own it by any means. Yeah, and I don't, uh, and the, to uh, tend to the second question about raising money, um, you guys can have that discussion offline, but we can actually can't have that happen here at the foundation. Okay. So, uh, and got another question for you. Okay. Uh, question about the fee structure for the in the home and in the office. What and in the home you have the artists stay with them. What about on the office? Does someone in the office put them up for the night? And last part is, do you do any kind of referral fee so that if while you're in the office, somebody says, hey, I want you to come to my house tonight and I'll get a group together or tomorrow. Or, so that you, what are sort of the spinoffs? Well, so we already have these artists that are touring around the country or they're based in a particular area. So let's say you have an office here in Kansas City. We might have artists from New York or Seattle just happen to, to be 
coming through here, let's say in April, and you want to have your house, con your office concert in April, we say, great. Um, you know, Mika Polly is playing in your city that night already. Let's book your office concert on that day. So the office concerts aren't responsible for any sort of lodging or anything like that. So it's really, really simple. Um, and essentially, that's sort of the idea is that uh, is we're allowing our artists to essentially get paid to promote their shows, right? So they play your office that day and say, by the way, everybody, I'm playing at the Brick tonight. Come see me. You know? And so they might pull two or three new fans. Or uh, you know, for us, it's, just, it's, a matter, it's, a, it's a matter of taking this great music to people that might just be totally disengaged. You know, most people go to one concert a year, and it's Billy Joel. And so, you know, how do we combat that? Well, we take the music to, to the people where they work. Yeah. All right, question over here. So I see a very attentive audience, and we need a little wellness. Can we hear a song? I suppose, yeah. I suppose. Is it that time? Yeah, go for it. We got about three or four minutes. Mm -hmm. See if I can just take it. Let me take this off. Took this job just to hold me over While I saved some money for my dream Reality's getting so expensive I can only taste what I could be Wednesday night at the Yellow Film it's open mic and I'm gonna sing I've got a new song up my sleeve Yeah, I'm starting to believe The sky's not falling I'm starting to believe That there's a good chance of winning I'm starting to believe Like I did in the beginning So I'm selling secondhand guitars in a shop that should be boarded up. Once a week I roll on down the Roswell and I rock myself out of this rut. Wednesday night at the Yellow Fair. It's open mic and I'm gonna sing I've got some hope tucked in my sleeve Yeah, I'm starting to believe The sky's not falling I'm starting to believe That there's a good chance to win it And I'm starting to believe Like I did in the beginning now Yeah, the little part of me that's given up. Oh, the little part of me that's given up. Starting to believe. Thank wow. you very much. Thank you. So we'll, we'll stick around till the end of the thing. If I'd love to chat with you guys. Uh, don't have a whole lot of handouts. My bags didn't quite get here, but I'd love to take your cards and chat with you after the... Thank you, Fran. Time. Excellent. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, we've got one live announcement, but I do want to make sure you guys take a look at the back of the announcement sheet, um, the program. with We have some interesting announcements happening. Um, I'd like to bring uh, Nathan Kurtz up to talk about 
Fail night. Good morning. Uh, so on your sheet, all three of these items do require an RSVP, so please let us know if you can make it. Uh, we're going to do a 3D printing design course. There's actually three different nights, uh, so go to the Eventbrite page and sign up if you're interested. Uh, code Till Dawn is coming up next weekend. Uh, if you're at all interested in hanging out all night, hacking out code with some folks, or learning how to do that, uh, please again sign up online and check out that. The last thing is fail night. So most news about startups is companies that have raised a bunch of money, hired a bunch of people, or sold to another company. Uh, but majority of companies don't make it. And if you are, uh, if you had an idea that didn't make it, or you're interested in learning from others about ideas that didn't make it, please RSVP. We have limited seating, but it's a week from tonight, uh, February 26th, 6 to 8 p.m. here in Kaufman Labs. Uh, open mic night for a somber and celebratory event around failure. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, are we looking for a facial tissue sponsor for that night? We do need a tissue sponsor. OK, thank you. Um, moving on, we've got John Stram with Tutorius ready to present his startup. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Sam and I will not be serenading you today. So uh, I am going to tell you about Tutorious. It's a uh, nonprofit local startup. We do ACT tutoring and I founded it about three years ago. Now saying that we just do ACT tutoring is a little bit like saying that one million cups is just about coffee. So I'm going to explain to you today why we're a little bit different than our competitors and a little bit different than a lot of nonprofits really. So this I'm going, to, I'm going to explain this by uh, telling you about one of our students, and I should warn you that this, uh, this story ends in tears. But don't worry, these are tears of joy, so stick with me. Uh, this is Corey. Uh, Corey goes, is a senior at Hogan Prep, which is just down the road. Um, and all throughout high school, ever since his freshman year, he's wanted to attend Morehouse College in Atlanta. Um, so he did everything right through high school. He, uh, he got great grades, he's the school class president, all the teachers love him, he has awesome extracurriculars, and junior year comes around, he takes the ACT, and he gets a 19. Now, the ACT is scored from 1 to 36. This is the uh, standardized test you'll take as kind of a college admissions kind of thing, uh, similar to the SAT. Um, so it's scored from 1 to 36, and 21 is the national average. So 19 makes Corey look below average, which frankly is not the case. So, being motivated as he is, he studies hard, he you know, prepares himself, takes it again, gets a 21. But again, that's average, and this is Corey we're talking about. So this is where we come into the story. Um, Corey was in our class last semester at Hogan Prep, um, and he'll admit that at first he didn't take our class seriously, and if I'm gonna be honest, it's probably because I tell a lot of bad jokes in the class. Uh, I was actually teaching it. Uh, for example, I'll tell the students that I actually got a 38 on the ACT, because not only did I get every question correct, but I write little love poems in the sides on the margins and give me extra credit. So anyway, so lots of bad jokes and he didn't take it seriously, but as his score started going up, he started trying harder and harder and then test day came around. Uh, he did well. He actually, his score went up four points. So he got a 25. So everyone's really excited, but better than this, uh, Morehouse accepted him and gave him $120,000 in scholarships. Massive, $30,000 a year for four years. So we're excited, everyone's excited, and Corey is so excited, he tells me that when he found all this out, he literally cried. So, again, saying that uh, we just do ACT tutoring is a little bit uh, underselling what we do. We're not just about tutoring, we're about making kids cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's, I mean, there's probably a better way to say that. So, uh, uh, let, let me explain how I got into this. So I used to work for other uh, test prep companies. And the thing about them is they charge outlandish prices. So like sometimes like $1,500 for a course. Uh, so what I wanted to do is take my uh, abilities and give it to everyone. I wanted everyone to have access to it. So I decided the best way to do this would be to start a nonprofit. So founded it in 2011. And as our first fundraiser, I shaved my head. Uh, didn't give it as much money as I was hoping, but. Um, <laughs> so we, about three years ago, we started and we tried and we failed and then we pivoted and failed again. We'd probably go well with that failure entrepreneurship thing, tell plenty of stories. Uh, we finally hit our stride though about eight months ago. When I say hit our stride, it means we, we kind of figured out our class model and our business model. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our class model. Now a traditional class, um, we'll have a teacher and you have lots of students and 
you might be awesome in math, and someone over here, actually, Cindy, I know you're not good at math, so Cindy might be in the class, and so I'm trying to teach both of them. Neither of them are getting what they want, so what we do is we bring in tutors into the classroom, uh, hence the name Tutorious. So we, what, what will happen is I'll introduce the topic, the teacher will say like trigonometry, and then we'll go over examples on a level that's much more relevant to the students, much more where they're at, and it makes it way more individualized, way more effective, and frankly, that's how Corey's score went up four points. Um, so our business model, though, is also very innovative. Um, originally, when we started off, we just relied on philanthropy, uh, fundraising, traditional nonprofit. That's how our, our, last, our last fall Hogan class happened. Um, we, got a, we got a grant and that happened, but we realized, though, if, if our competitors are charging a ton, they're at the top, and we're kind of you know, going for the students who can't really afford much at all, there's still this huge gap in the middle. So we decided to go after that as well and adopt what we kind of can easily be compared to a uh, Tom's Shoes model. So students will pay us for this same ACT course about 400 bucks, so way less than you'll get anywhere else. And we take that money and we subsidize our Hogan courses as well. So this allows us to diversify our income, which really helps us be more reliable, and also it helps us achieve our mission, which is to give everyone access to tutoring. Um, so where are we now? Uh, right now we have two programs going on, one paid, one actually at Hogan again. Um, we'll call those our scholarship programs. And this semester we want to have, or this, this whole year, 2014, our goal is to have 100 students. Now, out of those 100 students, we hope we have tons more Corys, lots more stories to come tell you, like, hey, this kid got $90,000 in scholarship, just absurd numbers. Uh, we also hope we can help the students who have done everything right get over that last hurdle, that ACT, and get into the colleges they deserve. Uh, but for me, personally, I just kind of want to make more kids cry. Thank you. John, I got a question for you up here in the front. Um, okay. So when we talked on the phone about your company, I was just fascinated by, by the difference between the, the, the test, popular test press companies that you were talking about and what you guys are pricing at. Right. Can you just talk about the, the um, pricing model and, and yeah. how come those prices keep going up and, and why so many students aren't able to access that? Sure. So AZT tutoring and test prep in general is one of the easiest sales. Um, you can charge $1,500. I've heard of like $3,000 courses because you raise the score of two points, which if you're paying $3,000, that better happen. If you raise the score of two points, you're going to get like $5,000 a year. So the payback is so easy. So people charge outlandish prices out front because they can. Uh, now their margins are huge. I know this because I used to work with a lot of them. Um, so what we do is, as a nonprofit, we just no one takes it off the top. We cut out those margins into what we need for operating, and that's how we're able to charge what it actually costs. Um, so that that's kind of how we came across our our pricing model. Hello, I'm Sam. Sam. I'm working on tutoring projects like this as well. I had a question about where you get your tutors. You, you're a nonprofit. Did you ever try to get volunteer tutors to do some of the tutoring for you? And yeah. yeah. How did that go? <laughs> so remember I mentioned failing and pivoting and failing a lot. Uh, that's because we tried to do a volunteer model, and I was not prepared to be a volunteer manager. Um, so we actually pay our tutors, and I think like 80% of our tutors come from UMKC. Uh, the only other, I think we have one who like just got out of college. So they're all college students, and that really helps us with um, connect with the students because we're so close in age that we can really relate to them. We can make the same jokes about whatever bad rap music is out right then. I, I don't know. We can we can really connect, and it helps us um, in those small groups really become uh, close and actually more effective. Um, finding volunteer tutors was very difficult because we couldn't get the consistency that we needed. Because um, again, it's a lot about building that relationship in your small group, and if you don't have that uh, consistency of a tutor just, I don't know, if you're a volunteer, you don't have anything other than your goodwill keeping you there. And frankly, sometimes that's not enough, so we do pay our tutors. Thank you for the question, though. Very good. good morning. Um, Senator. Ah, there you are. <clears throat> Is there a reason why you uh, chose the ACT for tutoring as opposed to like PSAT for like National Merit Scholars? Right. Um, okay, so there's ACT and SAT. They're essentially, for most purposes, they're the same test. They're both standardized. 
Uh, the test she's referring to is the PSAT, which you take before. It's not used as college admissions. Um, it's used for something called the National Merit uh, Scholars, and you can get some scholarships from that. Um, we chose ACT because, uh, A, that's what I focused on, but ACT is very focused in the Midwest, whereas SAT is popular on the coast. So um, if, we're, if you're ever in New York talking to someone about standardized testing, it's going to be SAT that they're talking about. I think Texas might be SAT as well, but... Texas. Um, so, but in the Midwest, ACT is more popular, and that's why we're focusing on it, because that's, I mean, that's where we are. And also, I think this past year is the first time there was more people taking the ACT than the SAT. So, thank you. John, I have a question on your left here. Um, is there anything in particular about your curriculum that you feel is um, exceptional, um, stands out, and also how do you come up with your curriculum? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the curriculum is my brainchild. Um, so it's just my experience from tutoring. I tutored a lot before I started this. Lots of experience doing ACT. And so I kind of uh, created it based off of that. Uh, I will say, though, that as we go forward, curriculum is something that we're going to stay committed to reinventing and constantly getting better. Just that's, that's our R&D. That's what we're investing in to keep getting better. We don't want to stop until like we're getting everyone increasing seven points, something insane, I don't, I don't know. Um, so the way I came up with it was just based off of my experience. And um, I mean, again, we're just gonna keep trying to redevelop that. that. All right, we got a question over here. Hi, um, I was wondering if you, um, if you had a plan to get your business into high schools, because um, I went to Park Hill South up north, and we had to pay so much money for prepping for ACT, and mm -hmm. it'll be really nice to have something like this for the kids back there, because there's such a wide margin between the really um, wealthy students and the ones that can't afford this, and sure. it'd be nice to have this in the schools. Yeah, uh, so our plan going forward is we want to be, we want to dominate the Kansas City market. We want to be touching as many high school students here as we possibly can, and the way we do that is by establishing partnerships. Um, so in certain schools, it makes more sense to do that first model that I showed with like the grants. So maybe uh, lots of maybe charter schools have you know community partners who might want to bring that in. Whereas with some schools, it might m make more sense to do more of like a contract basis, which is more on, on that one on this side. Sorry, I don't have that slide up. Um, so again, we're trying to establish those partnerships. So if I mean, if anyone has connections to high schools, come talk to me afterwards. We definitely are interested in getting into more high schools. John, you were talking about your story a little bit and how you pivoted so much. Can you talk about some of the lessons that you've learned for young and aspiring entrepreneurs in the room? Yeah. Um, I had to get used to failure pretty fast. I can't tell you when I was trying to do these volunteer, this volunteer form that you asked about. Um, I, I would have these like tutor trainings and I'd put flyers up all over UMKC and like two people would show up and it would just be so disappointing. Uh, lots of times I'd go into schools and, uh, I mean, I don't exactly look old and experienced, so they'd be like, oh, I thought you were older from your email, and then just like dismiss me and I'd get nowhere. So uh, it's going to be an uphill battle. I guess my advice, um, if I'm even in a position to give it, would be keep, I mean, you're going to fail and just keep going after that. And honestly, networking. <laughs> networking has been the biggest help for me, I'd say. All right, we got a question in the middle. Um, you you said that like some students are better in some areas and some people are uh, worse in some areas. Right. I have found that when I teach something personally, I learn it better myself. Yeah. Do you have a model that has it where the students become the teachers, where they go and are being the tutor for that section or whatever to help not only the students but help themselves learn it on a better level? Right. So we don't have something exactly what you're referring to where the students are teaching, but um, you're exactly right, you learn way more when you teach it to someone. I know more about trigonometry than I ever wanted to because I tutor it all the time. Um, that's the beauty of the small group model. We have one tutor and five students, so I mean, we can, the tutor is going to break it down for them. But there's always going to be a student who doesn't quite get it, and there's going to be a student who gets it a little bit more, even within that group. Um, so the beauty of the small group is that you get those two next to each other, and they work with each other, and I think there's, Oh, gosh, I wish I could remember the name of the study. Studies have just come out that that exact thing that you're referring to, the students working with each other in a small group, is incredibly effective. 
So not exactly what you're saying, but yes, we encourage our students to work with each other. John, I got a couple questions for you in the middle here. Couple, all right. Number one, I'm extremely impressed with what you're doing as someone that had to take the ACT recently. Thank Keep you. it up, man, because the way that we're doing it now is horrendous. I agree completely. Uh, second thing is, it sounds like you're kind of basing everything around going to the school. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about having kind of a bricks and mortar location and taking kids from Hogan, taking kids from, you know, maybe even a Kansas school, bringing them together and, you know, kind of intermixing there? I know we don't want to cross the state line, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, that's a great point. So the, one of the best parts about our business model is we don't have bricks and mortar. We, uh, the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership, which is over at 47, 47 Truths, they've given us office space, which has helped us a ton with costs. And uh, we don't actually have our own locations just to keep costs down. Because if we get our own location, then we're not gonna be able to charge you know, 400. We're gonna have to get, do a lot more. So the, I mean, that's one of the best parts about having our nonprofit status is that these schools can donate the space to us and we can work in their schools. Um, as far as students coming into one location, that is kind of what we do with our paid programs that I'm motioning to, even though they're not even up there anymore. Um, so students will come from all sorts of schools to one location. Again, it is not our location. We usually get it from a school, but they will come from all over to kind of a central location. Got another one in the middle here, and then Brian's got one from Twitter. Okay, one from Twitter. Okay, so as far as uh, your uh, standardized testing is concerned, what is the average for the country whenever you get the specialized testing uh, tutoring versus your averages for your own personal company? What have you seen? Yeah, good question. All right, so last fall was our very first go at a full course, and we were so excited because uh, we came up between two and three points, and that is awesome, because I'll tell you from experience, that's about the industry average, and we hit that on our first try. Um, lots of times you'll hear people say three to five points uh, increase is average, but um, not to get too far into statistics here, but the median is probably about two and a half. Three is probably a whole standard deviation, and five is almost unheard of. I've had a couple students, but, um, so everyone's gonna say three to five. Reality is like two and a half to four, maybe. So that's about average. So we're, we're hitting it. We're not where we want to be. We keep getting better, though. That's why we keep investing in our curriculum. So good question. Well, a question from the Twitter feed. All right. Uh, at SubBob is wondering um, if, there, if the environment between varsity tutors, tutorials, Maranatha Ed, who's another One Million Cubs alum, um, and other similar companies are more cooperative or competitive? Hmm. Uh, so you know how I mentioned those massive profit margins? Well, the Test prep industry is kind of ruthless, I'm not gonna lie. I don't have many friends in the ACT uh, business. Um, most people are kind of, kind of angry because they're like, ah, oh, you're messing up our racket. Uh, so, yeah, uh, getting the cooperation, I mean, we're a nonprofit, we wanna cooperate. We, our goal is to get it to everyone, so whoever can help us, that's what we wanna do. Um, I will say, though, I haven't had many positive experiences with competitors. That question nice. in the back. Yeah. Do you have a guarantee that if my kid can't go five points higher that he can take it again or whatever on that kind of thing? Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> Shucks, I wanted to sign it back up. Um, I, I think, okay, so lots, lots of companies will have a, a point increase guarantee. Uh, we don't have anything like that yet, uh, but what we like to do is we see there's a strong correlation between the amount of effort a student puts in and the amount they're going to get out of it, which shouldn't surprise anybody. Corey worked his butt off, and that's why he went up four points. Um, so for your student, I would say if you work hard, then I can informally guarantee. Um, we don't have any policies in place for that yet, but that would be definitely something to look into because people love that. Got a question for you up front. Sure. Great concept. Um, it just strikes me, uh, data, and how you know what you know about the effectiveness. Um, just my personal experience, it's been a long time since I went through this myself, but the, the services at the time were so high level in terms of just approaching the whole entire thing, where in reality, I'm wondering what you know about your data and how you can use that in two different perspectives and what it might mean for your business as a third line of revenue the information about the information in terms oh, okay. of the curriculum development in the schools themselves. 
if you're tracking down to the level of individual specific areas where you know trouble tends to occur at a higher rate right. than other areas and really attacking those problems more in a more focused way and then utilizing that data if you could to help the schools become better at what they do. Using data-driven decision-making yeah. to help the schools and also help your results, I'm wondering what you have planned in that area. Yeah, no, we haven't gone down that path yet, but that's a, that's a fantastic idea because we do, we can tell like, oh, all the students who had, who've gone through this school really are not awesome at trigonometry. I keep using that as an example, I don't know why. Really not good at trigonometry. Um, so we can go, like I think what you're saying is we go to the school and say, hey, you should, probably step up your trigonometry. Um, we haven't explored that as a revenue stream, although that's very interesting. I am not a, uh, as proficient in data analysis as I should be if I was gonna do that. Um, but I mean, if you are a data wizard, come talk to me. We got a question to your right. Morning, John. Thank you. Jubal and Hanka, um, former teacher, and I also started a tutoring program in Minneapolis. Oh, okay. So two questions for you. The friendly? first, I'm sorry. Are you friendly? You're not gonna. <laughs> Minnesota nice is not a joke. Yes. <laughs> um, so how do you do the interview process for the tutors that you're hiring? Is my first question. My second question is, what is the age that you start that a student can enroll in this program? Is it freshmen, sophomores, juniors? Who's yeah. looking at this, or is it like? emergency, I'm a senior, and I need to get on board with getting a good score, so. Right, so yeah. to your first question, the, the interview, I like tutors who are very outgoing. Uh, you're gonna have to lead a small group of teenagers who don't care about standardized tests, and they're gonna be texting, and you just have to be able to be on top of them, very extroverted, very like, hey, pay attention to me, this is for you, not for me. So. I, I try to find, uh, I try to look for more personality traits. Uh, lots of companies, for example, one that I used to work for that I won't name, um, they won't let you take the ACT unless you have, or tutor the ACT unless you have like above a 32. And that cuts out so many potential awesome uh, candidates for tutoring. Frankly, I've seen a lot of people with really high scores who can't communicate what they're trying to say. Everyone's run into that. You have a brilliant math teacher, you have no idea what he's saying. Um, so I look for, I don't, I don't look for their scores as much, I look for their personality. Um, in regards to oh, age of when they go in, we do focus on juniors and seniors because you'll take the test into your junior year, beginning of your senior year, so you can get your applications out. Um, but we are working, this is kind of, I'll give you a little sneak peek, we're working on something, it's kind of like an ACT pipeline, so we'll start working with them freshman year, maybe hit them like once a month and then increase the frequency all the way up to when they take it, they're basically taking our course that we have now, and then they take the ACT, and then, so we're gonna ramp up. So we would start with freshmen right now with juniors and seniors. All right, we got another question in the middle. In the future, are you going to expand off the ACT prep and lead into like MCAT, LSTAT, as you guys grow, are you planning just to stay in that individual market? Uh, yeah, so our, uh, we're gonna focus on what we are awesome at first. Uh, so once we you know, absolutely obliterate the ACT market and I make lots and lots of enemies, then we're gonna go <laughs> into, I mean, then we, there's the potential to go to the LSAT, MCAT, those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, again, there's so much potential in the test prep market. Um, we have considered that, but that'd be pretty far down the road. So the, this storyline is, is a big part of my life because I took, I took the ACT five times to get into college and I was still a very low score. And I thought in the way the test prep and everything's marketed is that like, if you don't do well, you won't be successful in life. And, and sort of that same correlation, you know, it makes you, I, I felt like taking the ACT five times was actually more of a predictor of my future success than, mm -hmm. than the actual score. So I also thought that, you know, re reflecting back on the experience, that the, the students that got perfect scores and got full rides to school weren't as invested in their education, it seemed, more times than people who were really working towards it. So can you talk about that in terms of, like, it's just sort of a, an entry-level exam. It's not necessarily yeah. a future... Yeah, it's not the end all be all. Yeah. Uh, this is not determine your future. Um, honestly, I mean, I think I'm a great example. That is not 
that great of a predictor of how you'll do in college, assuming we're talking about grades. Uh, but I, lots of students, unfortunately, there is all this pressure around it, and, and part of what we do is we try to change their mentality as we go into it. We, my favorite analogy is like, think of it like a game. You're gonna, you go into a basketball game, the big, I don't know, championship or whatever, like you have those nervous butterflies and you just know you're gonna kick some butt. And you, you should have that mentality when you go into the ACT. Um, and so we try to do that. We try to uh, get them to think of it like, there, there's lots of the questions that are just trying to trick you. Um, lots of times there is no hard line for a college to accept you, no hard ACT score. Um, it helps with scholarships, but it's not the final predictor. So, I mean, we do try to work with them on a, just a mental, emotional level as well. I got another question for you. John, knowing that the predictor of success for some people is the score, which leads to more scholarship dollars. Yeah. Have you thought about an upsell or an additional product that's just a download that's teaching students how to write a killer essay or hmm. how, to, how to really find all the scholarship opportunities out there? Yes, and we've come to the that I mean, that's a very attractive idea. We get them to fill out their FAFSA forms um, to get student aid and all their scholarship essays. We actually want to lean more towards partnerships on that one. We want to focus on our niche, ACT, and we want to bring in other people who are good at that. Um, I mean, we have high school English teachers who would love to get their students into, into college with an awesome essay, and so we want to work with them. Um, I'm not sure we're going to start doing that, but that's definitely something uh, we've considered and we'll keep, we'll keep considering because, frankly, it's a great idea because um, it's just a continuous stream into college and we just add on that extra piece at the end. I, I like it, yeah. John, I'm going to ask the final question here. Um, you've got roughly 250 people. Um, what can we do for you mm -hmm. as a group? Uh, so two things. Uh, one, when you next time you hear about student debt, or, or scholarships, or you drive by UMKC, or even a high school, think about tutorials and be like, man, I know someone who could help kids get to UMKC, who could help reduce that debt. The second thing is I don't want to have lunch alone for the next month, so come by, give me your card, even if we don't talk, just write lunch on the back. I'll, I'll email you, we'll set something up, because I, I want to talk to you guys, I want to make these partnerships, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, um, I neglected to ask Fran the same question, what can we do for you? So I'm not, I'm not going to let him get out of here without answering. Thank you. So uh, the easiest thing that you can do is to buy an office concert package. And uh, the website will be up later this weekend, and those packages will probably start around $350. Um, and then, and obviously, uh, I, I did mention. I guess we can't mention the numbers, but uh, but we are looking to to raise funds to to staff up. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge Toby Trogue with Media Head once again for helping provide these handouts for us. And as you get up today, if you see one laying on the ground with you, we've got a recycling bin in the back. It'd be uh, much appreciated if you grab it. Um, thank you. We will see you next week. Have a great day.